uh, I'd like to introduce our first uh, keynote speaker of the evening, uh, which is uh, Healy Hamilton. Uh, she's chief scientist at NatureServe, uh, based in Arlington, Virginia. Just uh, a little bit of an introduction to Healy. Uh, she, uh, NatureServe, uh, has released a portfolio of maps that identify areas that are critical to sustaining our nation's rich biodiversity. And by our nation, I think she probably means the United States, but uh, certainly uh, think e efforts like NatureServe uh, serve not only uh, the US, but, but the world as well. Uh, NatureServe gets support from ESRI, uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Microsoft's and Microsoft's AI for Earth program. NatureServe and a network of natural heritage programs created a comprehensive set of habitat models for over 2,200 at-risk species in the contiguous United States, including those ranked as globally critically imperiled or globally imperiled, or those listed as full species under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Analyzed in conjunction with protected area boundaries, these data support mapping areas of high biodiversity importance and invaluable input to guide effective conservation decision making. And without further ado, Healy, please take it away. Thank you so much, Desmond, and also to Randall Green for the kind invitation to be able to have the honor of presenting one of the keynote uh, presentations at this Atlantic Canada Geomatics Conference. Uh, can I check my technology? Is everyone seeing the screen and can you hear me okay? And uh, not sure we if you're seeing you me okay or not. We can see the screen, so you're good to go. Okay, that's, that's great. Uh, so you might be wondering, you know, why, why are we, the Atlantic Canada Geomatics community, listening to a keynote lecture about biodiversity and especially biodiversity in the US. Sort of isn't biodiversity uh, a topic that's for people who are focused on the Amazon or the Great Barrier Reef? But we are all here scientists and practitioners of spatial data and not so much biological data. So I guess you could uh, sort of characterize this talk as the field of applied biogeomatics. Uh, which is basically a name that I just made up for a field of study that is the topic of this presentation, but that is also truly critical. So I want to actually spend a few minutes at the beginning just asking a question that is, uh, or answering a question that is very fair for all of you to be asking, which is, uh, why is biodiversity a headline topic for the geomatics community anyway? So simply put, it's because your life depends on it. I mean, biodiversity is every calorie ever consumed by every living being in the history of Earth. It's also the genes that underlie the variation, right? The variety in our food resources, which is variation that's gonna determine the future winners and losers that confer food security to human societies in a changing climate. Biodiversity is the basis of the medicines that cure our diseases, right? We have millions of years of chemical evolution that has been influencing species interactions, and that has produced a pharmacopoeia that is far more advanced and creative than what we have thought to synthesize in the labs. Biodiversity is even like the fabric on the clothes on our back or the sheets in the bed that we're sleeping in and sort of the padded comfort of the rugs that we are walking on. It's the forests that are providing the wood and the thatch that frames the buildings that we live in, the paper that we'll wrap our Christmas presents in and that we're gonna make our holiday cards out of. The diversity of life has also shown us ways to solve engineering problems, which has inspired a whole field called biomimicry. Like how do we reduce the resistance of the flow of air or of water over surfaces? Or how do we understand through the construction of bones in the human skeleton or tree trunks, how materials can be both light and incredibly strong and flexible? And I personally nominate this frog robot in the bottom right as the very coolest possible Christmas presents uh, since it's tis, tis the season. 
And it's not just the individual species that comprise biodiversity we depend on, but it's also their interactions. The interactions of species provide services that we cannot live without, including, of course, pollination services that we receive for free from ants and flower flies and moths and bees and birds and mammals. I mean, really, like what would our quality of life be if we didn't have bats to pollinate the agave cactus that we use to make tequila, personal favorite of mine. Coastal vegetation is biodiversity and it's, it absorbs like a sponge sort of the rising seas and it helps to mitigate the impacts of flooding and also of saltwater intrusion. And it's the trees that exhale the oxygen that we breathe. It's the coastal buffers that protect our communities uh, from like storm surges, which we know are only going to be intensifying in the years and the decades to come. The rivers that course through our forests, that clean and transport and deliver us the pure water that we depend on, that's biodiversity. They cycle nutrients that we need to grow our food. So these types of ecosystem services depend on an intact ecosystem of species, of lichens and liverworts and insects and inchworms, a web of life whose strands we are balancing on but that we rarely acknowledge. And Canada is a country that abounds in extraordinary biodiversity. It supports a remarkable diversity of ecosystems that include tundra and forests and grasslands and freshwater and oceans. Your surface area is almost 10 million square kilometers. That's almost 7% of the surface of the earth. And 40% of Canada is forests and woodlands that represent about 10% of the world's total forest cover. And very importantly, 25% of the world's last remaining unspoiled forests in the Canadian boreal are the largest intact forests that remain on the surface of the earth. You have over 8,000 rivers and over 2 million freshwater lakes that cover about 10% of your total surface area. These freshwater ecosystems have significance economically, ecologically, and culturally. You're bordered by three oceans, the Pacific and the Arctic and the Atlantic, and you have the longest coastline of any country in the world, nearly a quarter of a million kilometers. And there's been over 15,000 species that have been recorded in Canada's coastal zone, many of which are economically valuable, and that number is surely an underestimate. All of this biodiversity pumps billions of dollars that flow into the economy of Canada by people that are seeking to experience sort of the beauty and the bounty of Canada's biodiversity. Uh, Canada is considered a, sort of a standout gem of ecotourism. You offer experiences for people to discover and enjoy the natural habitats and the species that inhabit them. And year after year, that generates significant contributions to Canada's economy. Canadian ecotourists are motivated by the wilderness, by the parks and the wildlife species that Canada offers. There's over 70,000 species that scientists have identified as occurring in Canada's diverse ecosystems. And many of those are highly charismatic and some are found nowhere else on earth. Canadian biodiversity remains relatively healthy. It includes those large tracts of undisturbed wilderness, internationally significant wetlands and thriving estuaries. Over half of Canada's landscape actually remains intact and pretty free from human infrastructure. So hopefully now uh, I've convinced every one of you why we are discussing biodiversity at a geomatics conference and uh, also hopefully instilled in each of you some pride of stewardship for the globally significant natural heritage that Canada represents. And so now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the story of NatureServe and its network of biodiversity information programs, which includes every Canadian province. 
and whose mission is to develop and deliver the science to sustain the biodiversity that we now understand is so vital to our well-being. And so the story now is gonna to turn to focus on the geography of the US, but it also has applications and parallels in Canada. So the story of NatureServe and the NatureServe network actually starts over 50 years ago. Uh, it's re sort of remotely inspired or uh, somewhat connected to this photograph taken 52 years ago. It's called Earthrise. And it's probably the most influential environmental photo that was has ever been taken. This is a photo that further inspires a environmental awareness movement sweeping across our nation uh, that is demanding clean water and pure air and to sustain the natural heritage of wildlife and wild places. And in, on 19, in 1970, in April 1970, Earth Day, Earth Day saw 20 million people pour out onto the streets to demand legislation such as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed. That creates a mandate for the federal government to protect and recover species at risk of extinction, right? The people demand that we sustain our natural heritage. And so now conservation scientists have a challenge. They need to answer some of the most fundamental questions about biodiversity, such as how do we know what species in which places are actually at risk? And we did not have a systematic way to discover and document those answers. So recognizing this need to understand biological diversity in order to protect it and conserve it, scientists at the Nature Conservancy conceive of this network of natural heritage programs programs that are designed to answer those fundamental questions about what species exist, where they are found, and how they are doing. And so TNC started establishing what in the US are called natural heritage programs, uh, beginning in 1974 with South Carolina and Mississippi, as programs that were dedicated to systematically inventorying native species and identifying where they are imperiled and this network quickly grew throughout the US and spread into Canada, into Latin America and the Caribbean. And in Latin America and in Canada, these affiliate programs are called conservation data centers. And today you have one in every province in Canada. And collectively we became the Western Hemisphere Biodiversity Observation Network uh, the, that we are today. The NatureServe network, we, we record and we compile and we analyze and we share the highest quality scientific information on what species and ecosystems occur, uh, where they are found, and what their conservation status is, how they are doing, and ask questions uh, and document the answers to what we can do to conserve them. And our network from the beginning developed shared methods for uh, collecting and managing its observations and assessments. And since the very earliest days of computing, the network has pioneered technological advances in biodiversity data management. In 1993, that was the first time that the NatureServe network was able to look across its entire data set, uh, right? At this point, about 20 years of biodiversity observation to understand the species across all these jurisdictions. So in 93, the NatureServe Network published Perspectives on Species Imperilment, which analyzed the role of public lands in sustaining threatened endangered species. And this perspective is only possible because of shared data standards, shared methodologies, and a computerized information management system. One of the key things that the NatureServe Network does is we identify across a very broad taxonomically diverse group of, of species, what is at risk? So here you're looking not just at birds and mammals and amphibians, but at butterflies and skippers and dragonflies and tiger beetles and you know, conifers and ferns, freshwater invertebrates such as mussels and crayfish. And what you see here is NatureServe's conservation status assessment system where we rank 
the conservation status of individual species. And here again, we can aggregate across all of our biodiversity information network. So um, the yellow are species, the yellow bars indicate species that are uh, considered vulnerable, globally vulnerable, that's the G3 category. Orange means globally imperiled, the G2 category, and the red is globally critically imperiled, the G1 category. And we have very clear definitions for what each of these, what, how you get assigned to each of these categories. And the blue are presumed extinct. So we can instantly see, because of the power of aggregating information across our network, that freshwater invertebrate taxa are the most imperiled element of biodiversity. This is a US analysis in, in the US. And that was not even known until the NatureServe network undertook the, this aggregated assessment of the conservation status of biodiversity in the US. Again, leveraging computer technology, uh, as early as the year 2000, we, we produced a web-based encyclopedia of life that gave the public access to uh, information on the taxonomy, distribution, and conservation status of tens of thousands of species across the US and Canada called NatureServe Explorer. And I'm very proud to announce that just earlier this year in 2020, we completely modernized and redesigned NatureServe Explorer, which is providing the public access to these vast databases on biodiversity in US and Canada. NatureServe Canada has leveraged the network across all of the provinces in order to share its biodiversity data that is uh, assessing the composition and status and trends of Canadian biodiversity. And uh, NatureServe Canada has done this over time. So we, they did it in 2010. Uh, in 2017, came out with a report on guard for them about species of conservation concern in Canada. So. NatureServe Canada is, is sort of leveraging its network and that shared biodiversity data and constantly updating information so that conservation decisions can be based on the most accurate and current information. And that is in fact the heart of the mission of NatureServe and its network. So here we are then in 2020, right? It's 2020 and we now have this network that has been in operation for nearly 50 years. It's amassed over a million map locations of species and populations, and it has uh, fo focused on those that are rare, old, rare, sorry, rare and imperiled. So these data, as unique and valuable as they are, they still only represent the collective opportunity or the resources that are available for sampling biodiversity in the field, right, in nature. They are by definition incomplete. And yet every decision about conserving the diversity of life is ultimately spatial in nature. We have to find ways to improve the coverage and the resolution of our understanding of the, the most fundamental conservation question, where do imperiled species exist? And so the rest of my talk is focusing on, focusing on how we have leveraged in the US, uh, nature, the NatureServe network data, how we've marshaled technology and the expertise of the NatureServe network to answer that exact question. And here I want to outline sort of that, that issue that I just brought up about the, the coverage and the resolution of data about where imperiled species are. We have been living in a world of two extremes represented on each of these to the left and to the right panel and using this adorable imperiled salamander, the frosted flatwood salamander as a, a character, as an example. So traditionally there are two approaches for understanding the distribution of any species, imperiled or otherwise. On the left, those are confirmed occurrences in the field mapped by a, a NatureServe network species expert. They've been into the field, they know that the species is there and it's confirmed by those green dots. So we know if we just use that, that best available information, the, the confirmed occurrences in the field, 
we can't survey everywhere. Our surveys are not complete in space and time, and we're certainly missing places where this salamander occurs. We are under predicting the habitat that it occupies. We're also over predicting the places that it isn't. And the accuracy of this effort is completely depend on how intensive our sampling is. So it's, it's, it's not really replicable. It's, it's completely dependent on our, our resources available for getting into the field, which are never enough. On the right-hand side represents uh, sort of the equivalent of those blob range maps that we find in a lot of natural history guides. Here in the United States, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, it uses county boundaries and says, well, we know that the species occurs somewhere in this county and it depicts these huge areas where the species occurs somewhere inside of them. Now that is a complete over prediction of the area that the species occupies. That is not useful for the scale of conservation decision that we need to make in our country, in any, any in either of our countries or anywhere in the world, which are highly spatially explicit in nature. And so essentially solving this conundrum of having either too little data, right, underrepresenting or overrepresenting where a species occurs is a fundamental issue and a, a spatial data issue that is absolutely essential to how we choose to conserve life on this planet. So at NatureServe, we are leveraging our history of high quality species data and embracing modern tools of predictive modeling. So in, uh, called species distribution modeling or habitat suitability modeling. And we are uh, leveraging the increasingly available high resolution data that characterize all kinds of aspects of our environment and advances also in data science and cloud computing. So for example, walking you through this slide here, we're taking those species occurrences, the, it showed in the green dots in the panel on the left. We are querying hundreds of spatial data layers about the environment, about the climate, climatic environment, about the terrain and landform and slope and aspect, about vegetation and land cover and soils, hydrology, and we are querying the environment in those places that we know the species exists from our record of confirmed observations. And then we are using machine learning. And through machine learning, the machines can, can produce a distribution, a, a distribution map, a predicted habitat map shown here in a rainbow, where we're looking at, at those brightest colors, the oranges and yellows, that show us where else in the environment is the habitat suitable for this species? So we're, we're getting a, a every, every 30 meter pixel here. So we're modeling these at 30 meter resolution. And we're asking for every 30 meter pixel, our um, machine learning algorithms are giving us a probability of suitable habitat, which we can then place a threshold on and, uh, and say, we wanna know just the highest probability of suitable habitat in this environment. And perhaps we might query uh, threshold at this high level if we want to inform field survey efforts and send them to the places that the models say have high probability of suitable habitat, but that we have actually haven't visited. So model informed field sampling protocols. On the other hand, if we were um, worried about uh, some kind of land use plan, some transportation infrastructure or, or housing development, that might affect the, the salamander, then we can threshold at a more, provide a more th conservative threshold, sort of include both highest probability and medium probability of suitable habitat shown here now combined in pink and yellow. And again, we have this spatially explicit hypothesis of suitable habitat that is far more precise and lends itself far more robustly to the types of decisions that we need to make about conserving biodiversity every day. So instead of having on the left-hand panel, one of these two previously available, most commonly used sets of data, right? The green confirmed occurrences, which are an under prediction or the orange county boundaries, which are a, a absolute over prediction. We now have um, 
a map of potential suitable habitats uh, and it's traceable, it's documented, we can repeat our methods, we can improve the data over time, as I'll talk about a little bit more in the future here. So at NatureServe, we have been taking this technology of species distribution modeling and, uh, and, and ramping it up to the scale of our nation. And that is what the Map of Biodiversity Importance Project is all about. We are leveraging our 50 years of biodiversity inventory across the network, uh, advanced computational capabilities, cloud computing, the expertise of the biologists across our network. And we have produced 2,216 imperiled species distribution models for a broad suite of uh, species at risk that include not just birds, mammals, and amphibians, but freshwater fishes and mussels and crayfishes and plants and pollinators. And this would not have been possible without the key support of Esri, who's been behind this all the time. This was actually uh, a project that Jack Dangerman and I hatched together. And we were also supported by the Nature Conservancy, by a Microsoft AI for Earth grant. And this would never have been possible without the uh, data and capacity of the NatureServe network species experts. So here is an example of what the map of biodiversity importance, one of the maps looks like. This is the species richness. So it's stacking 2200 species distribution models on top of one another to look at hot spots for imperiled species in our nation. And here we're looking at truly the most imperiled species, those that are listed on our Endangered Species Act or those that NatureServe has determined through our conservation status assessments to be critically imperiled or imperiled at a global scale. So this is predictive distribution modeling truly at the scale of a nation. We can, we've also subsetted out the taxonomic, some, some taxonomic subsets here, and now I'm drilling in. Remember before we determined that freshwater invertebrate biodiversity is the most imperiled element of biodiversity in the US. And now we are seeing imperiled aquatic invertebrates at a scale never before possible. We're zooming into the actual stream reaches where there are suitable habitat for multiple imperiled species of freshwater invertebrates. And remember back in the beginning when we saw those beautiful rivers and lakes, I mean, it's those invertebrates are part of that web of life that are purifying our air and water and providing food resources for fish that we that we um, enjoy fishing and eating. So they're not just, I mean, they may be a uncelebrated element of biodiversity, but they are just as important. But we didn't just, you know, pull in a bunch of data about the environment and a bunch of data about where species occur, press the machine learning button and spit out some models. No, we did not do that. We have developed not just a series of products, but a process for producing this kind of data. So one step in that process was producing a way to evaluate the quality of models. On the right hand side, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of uh, decisions that we make along the way about the input of our data. We make decisions about our species data, about the, those environmental predictor data, about how we model, how we validate those models. And so we got together with scientists from the US Geological Survey, from the US Department of Agriculture, from other, from natural heritage programs, uh, from the National Invasive Species Council. And together we came up with a rubric for assessing data quality of models. And every one of our 2200 species models has this assessment rubric as part of its metadata. And so as data improve, you can see us move from decisions that might cause us to say red or yellow or green, which pr those are provide increasing confidence in model output. So we can now, for the first time ever, have a way of assessing the quality of our models that has been published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. We also created, and here we had enormous help from Esri, a national library of 
predictor data at 30 meter resolution for over 250 elements describing our environment. So here, um, I mean, I find these maps just as artistically beautiful as they are data rich. So I'm just gonna share a few of them with you. So this is what we query in order to create that envelope of conditions that create that that determine a, a species distribution model output output. So we look at aspects of climate. We look at aspects of land cover. This is coniferous forest cover across our nation. Hydrologic connectivity. We have over 150 aquatic variables to help us understand aquatic species distributions. We have variables about soil that is so important for determining plant species distributions. So this national predictor library lives, it's terabytes of data and it's living in the cloud and can, can be queried by any of our scientists as part of this process of the map of biodiversity importance. We also created a web-based tool that would allow our experts throughout our network to review the quality of a model. So here, the yellow is a, uh, again, a salamander model. Anyone can securely log on to this web-based review tool. They can go to a pull-down menu and pick a species that they're an expert in, and then the model will be populated in a map viewer. We can then, they can then decide on a Yelp score for this model. They can click on and off watersheds where we may have overpredicted or underpredicted. They can drop their own point locality data into this model and they can send us comments and feedback. And then we have this record of how, what we need to do to improve our models. And so again, this is helping the process be iterative over time so the data get better and better. And the power of our network is amazing. Across the NatureServe network, we had almost 2,000 reviews submitted for 1,500 of those over 2,000 species, almost 100 scientists contributing from 30 states. And so this, this, and we asked them to do it in the middle of field season for free in a short period of time. So we could probably even get better participation if we had a little bit more time and didn't do it in the middle of the field season, but that's how the timing turned out. And still we had a massive volunteer effort from our network. So I really wanna emphasize that we have both the products of the map of biodiversity importance, and here's sort of our flagship product, which is these 2200 models but now they're weighted by their range size so that species that have narrower ranges and are endemic to smaller areas, they've been weighted compared to species that have wider ranges and are found over a larger area because narrow range species have fewer opportunities for conservation intervention. And then in this analysis uh, that we call beyond protected areas, we're also taking into consideration, well, we have a protected area estate in the United States and there, and much of it is managed for biodiversity conservation. So in this map, the areas that are highlighted as orange or yellow, this is where imperiled, narrow range, unprotected species occur. This is a map to preventing extinctions in our country. And so this map is one of our products and we're equally proud of our process, where we're taking our species occurrence data, we're using that environmental predictor library that we've created and put into the cloud, we're leveraging com computational technology, scripting, ArcGIS Online, R, this whole thing is set up in Azure, thanks to the Microsoft AI for Earth grant, that spits out model products that we can then use our web-based tool to review, in some cases, we now have funding to start field validating those models, which then starts the process all over again so that it can just get better, the data can get better and better. So it's not a static process, it is dynamic. Underlying those national maps then are the individual species distribution models. And those individual models can be analyzed sort of in a jurisdictional analysis. They don't only help direct field efforts, but they also help us understand responsibilities. 
So here we're looking, the inset map in the bottom left is showing you uh, an area on the border of Northern California and Southern Oregon, where we have a couple of national forests managed by the US Forest Service that are depicted here in brown. And here we have this absolutely beautiful, critically imperiled plant, and we have its predicted distribution model. And now we know that the entire modeled suitable habitat for this species occurs within the US Forest Service jurisdiction, that they have responsibility for the persistence of this species on behalf of the public trust. We didn't know that before. And now we can look at the individual species maps, over 2000 of them, and ask these similar questions. We can ask where are their co-occurring imperiled species? So this is another Forest Service example in this um, inset map on the bottom left, we are now in the state of New Mexico. We are zooming into an area in the Lincoln National Forest outlined here in green. And, um, the, and so then you can see in the series of thumbnail maps on the right, the pink is the predicted habitat model for these three critically imperiled and imperiled species and they all co-occur in an area right now that is managed for multiple use, meaning off-road vehicles, logging, mining, recreation, hunting, fishing, biodiversity. And so the Forest Service needs this information in order to be able to balance the, the different demands on these multiple use public lands. So, that's some examples of the map of biodiversity importance, both the products and the process, and how it has some applications to sustaining biodiversity in, in the United States. The metric that we're using here is imperiled species, but that is really only one metric of biodiversity value, and there are lots of others, of course. There's species aggregation, like breeding aggregation, or you know, like waterfowl. There's ecosystems that are imperiled. There's intact landscapes that are important for biodiversity. There are conservation values. There are a, a range of them, and they've been formally defined by an effort called uh, key biodiversity areas. So um, key biodiversity areas, or KBAs, are a global effort to identify and delineate the places that matter the very most to keep nature thriving. And so in your own country, with support from Environment and Climate Change Canada and led by an absolutely amazing network of conservation organizations, including NatureServe Canada, uh, Canada is currently undergoing a process to identify and map their key biodiversity areas. And you can hear more about essentially the Canadian version of MOBI, the map of biodiversity importance, uh, there's a Canadian version that has been supported by Canada's KBA effort, and it's called Ecosystem-Based Automated Range Mapping, or EBAR, and uh, you can learn more about it by attending Randall Green's presentation. So if you want to learn more about uh, KBAs in Canada, you can go to kbacanada.org. There's a wonderful video there. And in a way, this represents an alternative network of biodiversity information uh, organizations leveraging technology and leveraging their own expertise to identify and delineate the places that are so important to sustaining Canadian biodiversity. I want to make you aware of another network that might be of interest to those of you who maybe now want to become applied biogeomaticists. <laughs> And that is the Society for Conservation GIS. Um, one of the leaders of this society, Meg Southey, is part of Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, um, the organization really leading the charge to identify Canada's KBAs, key biodiversity areas. And so there are lots of opportunities to get involved in this very vital and meaningful application of geomatic science in conserving biodiversity. So I just wanna close with that idea of networks, of what it means to get involved in the world that we live in today, right? The challenges that we face in our communities and in our societies, and indeed like even just humanity itself, they're sometimes so devastatingly overwhelming. But we have the most powerful and diverse and creative toolkit to address those challenges that, than we've ever had before. 
data is pouring in across space and time. And computational capacity to make sense of that data is growing exponentially. And technology can connect us into networks that can work together to solve our common problems in ways that have really never before been possible. And so you are the geomatics community of a country that holds our planetary web of life intact. So leverage that data and put that technology to work for you and invest in and build your network of collaborative solution finders. And uh, hopefully along the way, you will discover the applied biogeomaticist that has been uh, lurking inside of you all along. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Haley, that was great. We will have a few questions. And that is, uh, what would be one or two key lessons for a country wanting or needing to roll out broad scale habitat suitability modeling? Well, I think I've tried to address that in, in my talk a little bit. Um, I mean, we, without the support of ESRI and Microsoft AI for Earth, right? That the computational backbone of such an effort is absolutely essential. And so finding those technology partners who understand and will support the endeavor that you want to undertake is absolutely essential. And then you know, we leveraged this biodiversity information network that had been created, the NatureServe network, the power of the people who came together to make sense of what the computers spit out, right? That validation effort uh, has been essential. And I'll say not just to the scientific effort of making sure that our data are as, as, uh, as high quality and uh, robust as possible, but also to the social effort of bringing us all together and making us feel part of something larger than ourselves and recognizing the value that each one of us brought. I mean, really, you know, a network around a shared vital common goal is one of the most uplifting things that we can do as scientists and as people. Thank you. We have a question from Anonymous, a uh, very common name uh, in this world. <laughs> you mentioned that scientists put in effort for quality check, but do you have a quantitative number for accuracy in that final map? So the accuracy is, is assessed at the level of each individual distribution model. E each individual habitat model has a series of statistics that are used to validate the quality of that model. Uh, and, and that essentially, those individual statistics are what we use to validate for the input. I mean, there is really no way to know until you go and do field work and start discovering these species in space that you, they're, they're models, they're hypotheses of the spatial distribution of an imperiled species. So we do not have a collective quantitative value. Uh, we just have as many validation statistics as we were able to come up with. And importantly, we're driving field inventory. Right. These maps are helping us encourage people, qualified scientists, to now go out into the field and try to find uh, species in these modeled habitats. And we have, in fact, been successful. And then in turn, that data go back into another round of modeling so that the data for decisions is always improving. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and now the uh, questions are coming in uh, fast and furious. So um, I guess I won't get to ask, ask my question because we, we may run out of time. Um, so uh, Blair Scriven asks, how could we best use the data and research from NatureServe to inform policymakers and non-scientist citizens? That's a... Haley, I think you... Um, Oh, sorry, you were oh. broken up there for a second. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, hopefully I'm back. Um, so for policymakers, I will say that we are already trying to leverage the products of the map of biodiversity importance uh, on behalf of the Department of Defense, the Bureau of Land Management, and the, and, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service in the U.S., and we're in conversations with the Forest Service similarly. So uh, all of those federal agencies see applications of this work. And also we are working with state agencies who develop state wildlife action plans um, 
wherever they are interested to try to share the, these products in ways that will be relevant to biodiversity policy and, and decisions on the ground. For the citizen scientist, I think um, what I would really like to do, I mean, it, having citizen scientists work with the species that are the most imperiled comes with some pitfalls because uh, a lot of these species are imperiled due to overharvesting. There's a demand for them. And so we don't necessarily want to put fine resolution models of where our most imperiled species are out on the landscape for citizen scientists to go test necessarily. However, I would say that if we did something like this for species whose trends we're concerned about, there may be, you know, they like monarchs, right? Or bat, like not bats, monarchs, maybe species that have been common, but are perhaps becoming vulnerable. They may be in decline. If we could use models to send citizen scientists out to help us monitor the status of species that we're concerned about, but have not yet slipped to imperilment, I think that would be a very good way to engage citizen scientists in biodiversity, in understanding the value of biodiversity, while also generating information that would be valuable um, to pers the persistence of those species before they get more imperiled. Great, okay, so uh, some more questions here. Sarah Jenkins asks, are there a couple of key successes for species protection that have come from the NatureSurf efforts recently or have received attention that you'd like to tell us about? Um, so there are dozens of examples, especially within individual state natural heritage programs where they have used distribution models to uh, find new populations of species that were imperiled and then actually worked with local authorities to establish conservation easements uh, if, it's a, if it belongs on private land or to have new land acquisition for a new protected area. So we know that these models have over and over again uh, driven important conservation outcomes for species. Um, specific examples, there's this uh, sort of dubiously named really cool plant in, in the state I am in right now in Virginia called the Virginia sneezeweed, which was imperiled. And when the model came out, it said it was 30 miles further south than anyone had ever seen it. And all the botanists were like, no way, it's not there. There's no chance. And they went and looked and sure enough, they found a whole bunch more of it and were able to work with private landowners and create a new conservation area. And that story has been repeated over and over again throughout the network. Great, I've, there's another question here and I actually got a follow on question to go along with it. Um, Ambika Podell, hope I pronounced that right, uh, asks, I'm curious to know how long it took to compile all the data and make such a habitat suitability maps for the whole country. In current changing climate context and impacts from human disturbances, how can we maintain the quality of prediction using such maps? Um, and I would add to that, right. I noticed that NatureServe was, was uh, uh, started in 74, only two years after Landsat 1 was launched. I'm wondering, uh, along with those questions, I'm wondering, is there a connection there? Uh, well, I haven't been with NatureServe since 1974, so I actually don't know if there was a connection between Landsat getting launched and the NatureServe network getting formed. I I'm going to guess not. I think the connection was actually more around the legislation of the Endangered Species Act. Okay. Um, but the point is a really important one, right? Our environment is constantly changing. And those maps, those models are only going to be as good as the data that feed into them. And we've clearly demonstrated that a lot of that data is information about the environment. And so that's why I tried hard to emphasize that we've, we've not just produced the product of these maps, but we've set up a process that is highly dynamic where new data can go into it quite easily. And the, the whole modeling process can iterate so um, there's actually been a new national land cover data set that has been generated since we did this work. Uh, and we will be working to get those data in 
uh, as we rerun models into the future. Um, the F you said, how long did it take? Well, uh, Jack Dangerman, the founder of Esri, told me that he wanted the map in six months. And I laughed out loud and said, no way, you have to give us a year. Uh, and so it was, it was an all hands on deck effort. Uh, from start to finish, it took about 16 months, but I wouldn't recommend necessarily working at that, at that pace. It was, uh, a, a, and, and we only could do it because we had shared data standards, 50 years of biodiversity inventory, computerized biodiversity information systems that are the heart of the NatureServe network. There's no other organization that could have done this besides NatureServe. Great, so I'm gonna uh, ask one more question because we do have to get on to, uh, to uh, Nora's presentation. Of course. But Sarah asks, how do the models handle migratory species? Ah, so um, interestingly, uh, most of the species that were critically imperiled or imperiled um, were were not migratory. So you'll notice that it, this was a this was not a marine effort. So this was terrestrial and freshwater species. Um, so in in a lot of the migratory species are not reaching that level of critical imperilment uh, that so some of the more um, narrow range restricted endemics are reaching. So in a few cases, it would, it would, they would be represented more by sort of their stopover at that time of the year, but you'll notice these maps are not, they don't have a temporal dimension. So we are not capturing the full life cycle of a migratory species in the map of biodiversity importance. That's a great question that we can address when we have more resources to focus on individual species. This was really an aggregated national effort. But, but you do have some in there. I noticed uh, that you had, uh, uh, or maybe I've got it wrong, that uh, like mo monarch butterflies, for instance, are migratory. You probably have them in there, I'm guessing, right? So. Um, actually, monarchs are not in there because they're, no, they they're haven't not. reached okay. that level of critical not, ah, they haven't okay. reached that critical imperilment level. Gotcha. I might have shown a monarch um, when I was talking about the value of biodiversity, but they, they weren't in the, the actual map. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Haley. I really appreciate your time. I certainly will. And thank you for this opportunity to share our work and to hopefully inject a little biodiversity into the geomatics community. I really appreciate it. Thank you.